colloquium uh, Patavina. I am really it's a pleasure and honored to introduce uh, the guest of today, uh, Professor Terry Lyon from the University of Oxford and the Alan Turing Institute. Let me just uh, <coughs> say a few words of introduction. Uh, Terry Lyon uh, uh, um, got his uh, PhD in the uh, University of Oxford in 1981 and uh, under supervision of uh, Haydon M. McKean Jr. And then uh, he has had uh, the positions uh, in uh, UCLA, Imperial College London, University of Edinburgh, and uh, since uh, 2000, he's a uh, Wallace Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford. Uh, he has had uh, many recognition awards. Let me mention the Whitehead Prize in 1986, uh, the Polia Prize in 2000, he was invited speaker at the European Congress of Mathematics in Stockholm in 2000 and the International Congress of Mathematics in Seoul in 2014. He is uh, very well known for his fundamental contribution in stochastic analysis and application including mathematical finance and machine learning as I guess we will see also today. And he is worldwide known for having developed the theory of graph paths. I am really pleased to introduce Terry Lyon. Thank you very, very much. It's a wonderful. <laughs> Honored to be here. And um, yeah, I want to tell you a story. And the story is not about the lifelong bits and bobs that we've heard about just then. It's a very specific story about how a piece of mathematics that I've been involved in for quite some time, rough path theory, seems to have meandered into being a contributor to data science and to explain some of the mathematical reasons which I hope you get as to why it has something to offer and what it is that's different about it. And um, it's been quite a challenge developing this because there's a certain reluctance and hostility that's inevitable when you try and cross boundaries. And uh, this is no exception to that. It's been quite a long haul from the original idea that we might be able to say something to now where I'm pleased to say for the very first time four of my students have a paper in NIPS in the Curry in Vancouver in the, in the fall and so on. So I think we're slowly making progress in actually changing how people do things. But I want to emphasize we are not mainstream in data science. I'd like to be, but we're not, all right? So this is a story I hope you understand. I hope you get the message as to why it's relevant, why it's got something to say, but I don't want to pretend that it has been a mega success in data science yet, all right? It's going that way. I'd like to make that happen, but I don't want to pretend that it has happened. Okay. So... Graph path theory is an area of mathematics. It started off to tackle specific questions in stochastic analysis. There were two sorts of data and experiments that told one that the classical way of doing stochastic differential equations should not be the end of the story. If you got involved in numerics at that time, you'd have realized, or well, we realized, that numerically solutions to stochastic differential equations made sense path by path. If you use Levine's construction of Brownian motion, you did the approximations, you just worked every path. And there was a meaning to it. Equally well, there was some stuff in the Richelieu forms, you don't need to know what that is, that suggested again that you could do stochastic integration of things that weren't semi masters but there was a theorem around, Bichler's theorem, that said the only th that stochastic calculus was the end of the road. And in fact, it's not the end of the road, but the theorem that Bichler proved, because it's a theorem, said if this and this, when you weaken this and this, and then you get more. And um, the core idea of rough path theory is actually an analytic approach to understanding controlled differential equations. So a controlled differential equation is really a system where you have an input path and you get an output path in some phase space, state space, and you model that by a differential equation. But crucially, like development, if you know what that is for Cartan development, you allow yourself not just a straight line, not one ODE, 
but a family of ODEs, and at any given time, your input path selects according to its direction from those ODEs, and so you can change your dynamics. That's why it's called a controlled differential equation. Now, the challenge, the challenge that rough path theory broke was how do you make sense of such differential equations when the signal is extraordinarily rough? How do you make sense of it when it's sort of, you know, like a Brownian path or worse? And the answer turned out to be a bit of a surprise in a way. And I'm not really going to go into it, except to say that we found the answer. But the key to the answer was how you describe paths. You see, Kolmogorov has taught us that the way you do what is a path? A path is something that evolves in time. But Kolmogorov sort of told us that the way to understand a path is these gateways at fixed times. You want to know where the path is at time one, where the path is at time two, and so on, and you have more times and narrower gateways, you asymptotically get a description of the path. Right, well, there are many paths in the universe. One of them is, for example, a video. That's a path, it's evolving in time, where you would actually think this is a nutty way to describe things. You would not say, well, at the 13th frame, it was somewhere like this, and the 16th frame, it's something like that. It's just not how you work. The key to rough path theory is the realization that mathematically, you shouldn't adopt the Kolmogorov approach. In fact, it actually fails for, probably, for Brownian paths. They're on a sort of a, a, a cutting edge where that methodology breaks down. Um, instead, what you should do is a very natural thing in terms of what we do normally in human life. You should describe path in terms of a rough description of it, rather than where it is at a time, what it does over an interval. So you describe the movie by saying, well, the first five minutes, we've introduced the hero. The second five minutes, you got in trouble. And the final bit, da, da, da. And that's actually how we work all the time. It's about making mathematical sense of that. So the key is actually to understand that there is a top-down way of describing streams and paths, which is quite different to the bottom-up way that we normally use. So the key is to find a way to describe a path as a sequence of coefficients, like a Fourier series, but it's absolutely not, that, that describes the order in which things happen and gives a top-down description, not a bottom-up description. Because if you have a top-down description, it doesn't matter if the bottom is very complicated. So long as you know what the top few coefficients are, you might well have enough information to tell everybody what's happening. So that is a core basic point. And from our point of view, one of the key bits of this is what we call the path signature. And that's the thing that's going to play a role in my talk today. Um, the path signature is a very mathematical object. I mean, I think you see it in algebraic geometry. You see it all over the place. They don't necessarily realize it's referring to paths. But these objects turn up all over the place. And they turn up here. And we'll try and explain why they're useful. Now, one of the simplest examples of a path where this stuff was used at the beginning was actually to better understand Chinese handwriting. So this picture on the left, on the right, is actually symbolizes somebody putting their finger across their mobile phone and drawing Chinese script. Actually, there aren't many Chinese people in the audience, which is a bit surprising, really. In, in England, there would be lots of them. Um, and they would all poo-hoo this, because actually, young people never, ever write symbols. They use pinyin, which is much quicker. But people my age who want to preserve their culture are, are interested in doing it. Um, but it's a path. And it turns out that you can improve the quality of what's going on and get the state of the art by using this signature. And that was one of the first really practical contributions. That software was embedded in a prize-winning competition te technology, and then embedded in real-world apps for the iPhone and for the Android that were downloaded millions of times and translated and translate billions of characters. So this is an example of actually the real-world interaction with this stuff. It was probably the first real, real-world interaction. Um, but what I want to do today is tell you about it more generally. And I think the activity I'm most interested in at the moment, it's a bit jerky and I apologize, 
but is trying to understand actions and trying to understand actions not by looking at a complicated RGB image, but just by understanding the evolution of key points on the body. And why might you want to do that? One, because it reduces it to something mathematically tractable, because it's a moderate dimensional path. It's a path in something like 30 dimensions or something. Um, it is a path, right? It's evolving in time. It's described by 15 points in R2. That is a path, right? And we want to understand it, deal with it mathematically. Um, but also because actually it's practically interesting, because if you can make useful decisions about what's going on in a person using only that data, that data is de-identified. That data can make all sorts of decisions about what's going on without actually needing to see the individual people. So if you're monitoring a railway station or something like that, you may well be able to look at it all the time in this sort of way without anybody getting upset and figure out that somebody's fallen over or there's a fight without needing to get personal information. I'm not saying they wouldn't then get personal information out, but just generically it offers a tool, a technology for understanding actions of people without knowing too much about their personal identity. For example, there's some quite interesting, nothing to do with us, examples of this kind of data being used to monitor people in their homes because you can remove the person and just leave the matchstick man. And this is really helpful if you want to understand some old person like myself has fallen over at home and um, things like that, because people really do not want cameras looking at them and figuring out that they wander down to get their breakfast without getting dressed and so on. Um, and uh, so this is the sort of basic sort of idea that we're interested in. What's interesting to us is that this really is a path. It's a path in a moderate dimensional space. And um, using the signatures, not in a trivial way, it's quite an engineering solution to cope with the scaling of dimension and so on, but using them as part of a strategy does indeed manage to give you state-of-the-art outcomes, or when we were doing it, they were state-of-the-art compared with everything else. Um, and moreover, it doesn't need a very large data set to form the decisions. Uh, also, unlike deep learning, it's actually quite interpretable. You can, if you look through the analysis of this, I'm not gonna have time to tell you, but if you look through the analysis of this, you find that when you're trying to work out somebody's kicking, the real data sets here have, have like, uh, I can't remember, 60 different actions, and they're really drawn from the wild. I haven't got the originals here, but they're really drawn from YouTube, and every one is different to the next one. Um, the, the data sets you need to learn these things reasonably efficiently are not huge. You know, we're talking about maybe 20 of each action, 20, 30 videos for each action. And then you were talking about really quite good success rates. But this is, that's not meant to be like that, right? That's because the laptop somehow can't cope with loading the file quick enough. Um, yeah, anyway, it's fine generally. So you don't have to, by the way, now this is, this is the sort of input we use you don't actually have to go and find those points yourself because it's interesting. There is a huge data science industry of understanding objects, understanding photos, understand static things. It's the paths we're talking about where it's a much more challenging thing because it's immediately infinite dimensional. Actually, one of the things off the peg now you can get is you can get software which does a reasonable job of figuring out where all these landmarks are in real time. That uses deep learning, actually, um, and looks at the text and so on. But the British Rail can do that in their, in their uh, cameras of the station, and we can get vanilla skeletons with no identity from that. The main problem, if you look, is it's very noisy data. So actually, it's not, it's not that simple to make sense of that. But what I want to get hold of, though, is that in the current time, there are many paths in dimensions which are not ridiculous, but are certainly not small, 30, 50, 75 dimensions, which are just paths, but we're not used to thinking of them as paths, right? We're very neatly this idea of a path being, you know, a nice graph. But there are many situations in the real world where we have time evolving streams of data, 
paths, and we haven't really caught up with mathematically thinking about them. And I'm trying to persuade you today there is something to be done. So rough path theory is all about mathematizing, axiomatizing, abstracting how you describe complex streams and their interactions. Calculus. Newtonian calculus is all about how you model interactions between paths. But in that case, the paths are smooth. Rough path theory exactly extends that to how you describe mathematically the interactions of complex multimodal paths. Um, <clears throat> one of the most important things it does, and I'll spend a little bit of time later, is it quotients out an invariance. I guess you can all understand that if there's a symmetry and you're trying to learn from data, it's actually bad news. If my face is the same whether I'm looking that way, that way, or that way, so there's a rotation symmetry, and I'm trying to learn from data, I have to have enough data to learn that the symmetry doesn't matter. So every symmetry you have introduces a challenge for you in terms of amounts of data and learning. So it's nice if you can quotient symmetries. There's a very important symmetry in stream data that most people probably haven't thought about. And in pure math language, it's a gauge invariance. Um, and that is, and I hesitate to call it reparameterization because although it is reparameterization, you'll immediately say, oh, but there are times when I care about parameterized paths. We can come back to that in a minute. But one of the things you can do with a path is you can reparameterize the stream. You don't change the order of anything, but you do change the speed at which it comes. A very simple example of that is you drop a piece of data. You know, effectively, you've just sped up one little bit of it. But in practice, um, reparameterization of a path leaves a lot of things alone. It doesn't change a book. It probably does change a movie. But it doesn't change the movie if you think of it not as a parameterization change, but as a sampling rate change. So if you think of time as part of your variables, and you think of sampling as the thing that you're caring about, then resampling at a different rate is definitely an invariance. And so you think about it. How do you describe, so this is a mathematical question I'm going to spend some time on. How do you describe a path, a curve in R3, without parameterizing it? The way we've all been taught to do it, almost invariably, just to write it down in terms of a function of time. Of course, if it's an algebraic curve, we can might describe a polynomial or something and say that. But actually, how do you describe, you know, unparameterized, messy, real-world, non-analytic paths? It turns out rough path theory is exactly doing that. And that signature I'm telling you about is actually an invariant of the unparameterized path. And moreover, it's a faithful invariant of the unparameterized path. So it's actually precisely giving you the right set of coefficients to describe an unparameterized path. So in other words, we've had a way of looking at the data that took out the facial rotation, a way of looking at this stream that takes out an infinite dimensional, highly nonlinear symmetry. That's a big deal. And that's one of the reasons why it makes a difference because you've got this problem which, you, to sort out this invariant, you'd have to have a huge amount of data. It's an input group, and it's just a very messy thing. But we actually know how to take that signal and just slice out that piece of information and leave everything else. So there are many different kinds of stream data, and I think I've already put that down for you. We shouldn't be surprised, right? There are many different kinds of number. You know, there are three apples, three Lamborghinis, uh, three students in my class. Um, you know, there are many different units we can attach to numbers. And yet, when it comes to the calculator, the calculator is frankly indifferent to what you're calculating. We've learned how to do arithmetic. We've learned how to do um, long, long division without worrying about what we are doing. 
My goal, and indeed to some extent the rough path theory, lets you think about multimodal stream data in much the same way. It gives you a much, much richer mathematical structure to think about it and discourages you, at least in the early stages, from saying, well, this is engineering data or this is social data. Let's think about them differently. It's very much more the other way around, that there's absolutely some very profound mathematical things you can say before you get involved in whether it was social data or engineering data. <clears throat> and here's the math, or at least the beginning of it. So if that weren't there, and if we were in the reals, this would be the differential equation that describes the exponential function. It's a pretty basic function. Yeah? ds equals st. In fact, here, gamma is multimodal. So where does this live? Well, if we think of gamma as living in the space whose basis is letters, then this S lives in the space whose basis is words. It lives in the tensor algebra. And it's what we call the signature. It's actually measuring the response the nonlinear response to this path gamma against the various stereotypes and very simple set of differential equations. This is essentially a graded family of differential equations. And when we translate gamma into S, this is the translation from stream into signature. It lifts the path up into the tensor algebra. And it's actually the value of S over the whole path from one end of the path to the other, the change in S, there is this invariant that describes gamma. Now, one very important thing about this equation is it really doesn't matter how quickly we go along gamma. If we go along gamma a bit faster, we go along S a bit faster. The value of S at one end of the path divided by the value of S at the other kind end of the path, because it's an algebra, doesn't depend on how quickly we went along gamma but does actually define a whole shed load of information about gamma. And in fact, it's a mathematical result, which we'll come back later, that it describes everything about gamma up to a generalized notion of um, reparameterization. So this is, as I said, killing a vast, infinite dimensional amount of noise. And so you end up with small fixed dimensional feature sets describing this path. The data sets don't actually depend on the number of samples in your path, so they really squash down and make much more tractable high dimensional complex data uh, and giving you this top down description instead of a bottom up description. And it can, in the right place in other machine learning processes, make a very significant difference. So the way you tend to use it is not on its own, but in the middle of something else. You slip this layer in, and it just makes a real difference. There's another way of writing this signature, which is less symbolic compared with the non-commutative exponential, but it's actually more practical in many ways, and that's as a series of iterated integrals. And now you can see where the words come from. So if each gamma is a path in letters, then this thing is going to be a path in words or in linear combinations of words. And you see it evolving like, <clears throat> well, no, just evolving as the path develops. Well, it's a theorem, as I said, that these coefficients, so we fix the interval and we compute these coefficients. These are just a sequence of numbers. And it's a theorem that we Ben Hambly and I proved some time ago now that it's a complete invariant for the path it, up to reparameterization. And it makes very precise mathematically what you mean by parameterization. Actually, the sort of parameterization that you're allowed is a bit complicated. It says no tree like up to tree like pieces. So actually, that path and that path. are the same. And you can see they have the same effect, because you solve the differential equation along here, 
you solve it along here, you solve it along here, but then you undo that bit, you do that bit, undo that bit, you undo that bit and carry on. So that is a generalized form of reparameterization because you can form a homotopy of time inside the path back to the original. Interestingly, if you do that, you turn paths of value variation into a group that you concatenate two of them and then you remove the tree like pieces and you find that all works. It's not trivial at all. Um, so this was something we did, and it's about an 18-page paper. It's actually really quite difficult to prove this theorem, um, but it's a theorem nonetheless. And what's amazing from my point of view is that we're talking about something that runs from, you know, sort of abstract math over here to something really quite down to earth and concrete in the real data science world, which is sort of interesting. Um, There's a lot more structure than meets the eye, actually, about this. And one of the things when you construct a set of features is you should be interested in whether they describe all functions. I mean, I just said, look at the signature. I mean, who cares about the signature a priori? To make you care about it, you need to prove a lot of functional things, like polynomials are important on the line. You have many of those. One of the ways to understand this stream is actually through its coordinates. So if I take a collection of letters, I can project each coordinate, each term in the path onto a real path, and then I can integrate the real paths, and I get a real path, and I see that the word has actually successfully turned into a function on paths. So each word gives me a function on paths. So I could ask about universality. If you're a computer scientist, one of the things you want to know about neural nets is that they're universal. What does that mean? It means like stone vastros theorem. It means that actually any functional, any continuous function on a compact set of paths, say, can be approximated arbitrarily closely by one of these. And the original paper that proves that um, neural nets have this universality actually does use uh, harmonic analysis. It's quite a rigorous, Harm Bannock is quite a rigorous paper, and it gets 8,000 citations in the computer science literature. Um, here, because of the paper in the Annals of Math, it's easy to see that these things separate points. It's easy to say they contain a constant. It's easy to see that they, uh, well, it's actually easy to see that they're an algebra. Because if I multiply two of these together, something magic happens, which from a mathematical point of view is all about the fact that the enveloping algebra, the tensor algebra, is, so of the, of the group-like elements in the tensor algebra is the tensor algebra. It, I don't care really where it comes from, but it comes from a bigger picture. But something quite important happens. If I multiply two of these real valued functions together, that's what I have here. Right? I have the contraction of off onto the signature corresponding to a given word or a linear combination of them, and I multiply it by another one. Then it turns out there's a pure algebra representation of their product. And it's formed by doing a shuffle product. So if, you, if alpha was a word and beta was a word, then a word is a collection of letters. And I don't know if you remember, but playing cards isn't as common as it used to be. But one of the standard ways to shuffle is you take two packs and you lift them and you, rough, and you ripple one into the other. And if you consider all the different ways of shuffling these two letters, these two words together, so they preserve the order of each word, that turns out to be the product. So if I take two of these projections onto words, these are real valued functions, but when I multiply them together, it's also a linear combination of the same sort of objects. And the linear combination is given by all sh over all shuffles. So it's called the shuffle algebra. So the shuffle algebra, which you get by product given by shuffling, turns out to be a good model for functions on streams. And because it's closed under multiplication, 
it's an algebra. Stone bus just applies. Algebra with real valued functions containing the constants, uh, separating the points, then at least on compact sets, it's going to be uniformly dense in the algebra of continuous functions. Classical undergraduate mathematics of a function analysis kind. All right, so universality almost comes for free from the algebra. And I should mention that Chen, Katie Chen, was the first person really to look at iterated integrals. His analysis didn't really have the analysis. And rough path theory is a mixture of analysis and algebra. The analysis that I used more or less came from Elsie uh, Young. Um, and it's sort of a blending of the two to make all the integration and calculus work. But one of the things you can, another thing you can do, if you've got two real valued functions on paths, is you can integrate one against the other. You see, by varying the path, by looking at the path from its beginning of the interval up to t, and varying t, I, get a, I can apply my function to each of those streams, the truncated streams, and I can get a new path. And I can integrate one of these paths against another one. Now, it's an amazingly important fact, actually, that this is quite an analytic anal object. But in fact, it can be written down algebraically in what's called a half shuffle. So there is, again, a translation between um, mathematical algebra, uh, Hopf algebras, combinatorial or combinatorial Hopf algebras, um, and so on, and the way we think about functions on strings. There are lots of actual open questions in this space, some of which have recently been solved by one of my students, Chris Salvi, uh, in collaboration. Uh, and they directly throw light onto the questions of explainability that we were talking that we were talking about a bit before. So these are rich mathematical objects that have been studied by algebraists over and over again in the last 50 years. Um, and they link directly to how you think about functions on strings. Um, right, so this is just summarizing what I've said so far, really, in a way. But the signature is faithful. That's the Amazon math paper. Universal, that's the shuffle product and describes the functions on streams, but it does it in a very nice way because they're all essentially linear objects. They're all elements of that shuffle algebra. So that opens up a machine learning idea because one of the core ideas of machine learning, in a way, is that you, what, you have your function you don't know, but if you've managed to build a basis for the functions, you can then do regression. You can just try and find the linear combination of them that actually gives you the function you care about. Because it's a graded top algebra, blah, 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 there are all sorts of natural ways to grade the data, to take the lowest terms first, and so on, to do that. So it's almost at this point, it's obvious that there should be value in computer science because you can translate these feature sets into the normal language of computer science. You could write your SciPy package uh, or whatever. In fact, there is a Python package which we wrote before these things all became a thing, which is very simple. There are some faster ones out there by Jeremy uh, Reichenstein called IISig, but this is a very basic, simple one that's reliable and does what it says on the box, um, which all you have to do is do a pip install eSig, and you have a tool there. And it computes two things. It computes the signatures of paths, but it also computes the log signatures of paths. And it gives you the key for the graphs and so on. But it's actually surprisingly powerful for getting started with these things. Now we've got applications that are pushing us to develop it a lot more. And I've just got a big grant, which is helpful because one part of that grant is to pay for a uh, research software engineer to help us actually polish, develop the software. We know we can do it faster. We can know we can do lots of things. It's very much a manpower limited thing. So now I want to go back to these unparameterized paths and get you to feel why it is just so dramatic to be able to get rid of the parameterization. 
and why it actually cuts through some of the issues in recognizing streams. So here is a very simple object. It's a three written on the screen. And if we imagine it was drawn, there was actually a time series there somewhere. And here it is. And I'm just looking at the x coordinate, which starts near zero and finishes at roughly the same place, uh, but in the meantime moves across. And all I have done is change the speed at which I've written it. And you see immediately that there is an issue. These curves don't look like each other very much. You find it quite hard put as a human being. Say, so, oh yeah, that's a three. You know? I mean, it's not a three, it's only the x coordinate of a three, and I'll show you the y coordinate of a three. Um, and I don't think you'd be much better off, right? Uh, yeah, it's what people do all the time. How many times have you seen a piece of data drawn, several ve a vector value piece of data drawn, and all you see is the value of the x coordinate, the value of the y coordinate, the value of the z coordinate, and yet, actually, we are really stuck in trying to understand these things. The three was not such a complicated thing, but by the time you've written as a time series, it becomes complicated. And once you realize that often the time parameterization is simply not robust, you're going to write it in a hundred different ways and not recognize that anything like the same. So here, um, on the right here, you can't really see it. I've taken the signature of it. I've taken the log signature of it. They don't care about the parameterization, so they don't change. But I've also decomposed it into wavelets. And you see, if you think about it, it's sort of obvious that the wavelet expansion, which is sort of looking at what happens over this interval, what happens over this interval, and so on, it's just up completely by the reparameterization. The wavelets simply don't capture the, the time, the variation of parameterization at all. And so try to learn from this. You would have to work really, really hard because you'd have to learn that all these pictures are the same. They're not a linear parameterization or anything else. So that in a nutshell is why there is a very good value in being able to describe the path introducing a parameterization. You might think, and statisticians do quite often, that the answer is to say maybe do it at unit speed, parameterize it at unit speed, but you think about that, that goes seriously wrong in moderate dimensions. It's fine for one or two dimensions, but what did you mean by speed? You had to introduce a norm. Which norm? Um, you also realize that it's very hard to get uh, avoid interference between one part and another part. Because if you use unit speed for that body movement, well, was it your, what did you do when your eye blinked? So presumably that had to, speed went very slowly for that. But your blinking of your eye had virtually nothing to do with the motion of your arm or your leg. So you discover that you're distorting it again in ways that have nothing to do with what you're trying to recognize and just generating noise. Being able to understand and describe these things without such a parameterization is really valuable. Basically, the signature is functorial. It behaves extremely well under linear projections and so on, as well as doing what it says. There's some analysis in here, which I'm not going to go into. Um, <clears throat> but the rough path theory, so, Stochastic analysis is all about analysis, and there is actually this fact that the description through signatures is simply more efficient. You can't see. There are lots of paths you can write down where there is no movement on normal scales. All the information is actually in a high order oscillation. And if you try and capture that through a classical time series, you will fail. Um, I think here would be quite a good example, but I don't want to go into it. So here is actually a simple bit of so software, and you see that it's taking these two threes, which are not the same, and it's producing their log signatures, and at least the first few terms, the same size, the same signs, and so on, because broadly they are the same. And there is no parameterization in there. <coughs> well, the surprising thing is how far this goes. So, 
Streams involving data, as I said, like the calculator, are remarkably common. So we've already said a little bit about the Chinese characters. We've already said a little about, bits about uh, matchstick men. And uh, we have a project at the moment uh, funded by Turing, which is really doing looking at people. In, in one case, it's looking at them walking up escalators to work up if the escalators are safe. And in another case, it's actually we're entering a competition with Costain to see if we can't uh, help them get the contract from monitoring British rail, uh, well, not British rail, network rail sites. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>